Thomas, so you make a nice lecture here for the first time in the Zermatt Summit. Can you a little develop what is your vision and your criticism about the classical economists of today? Oh, so that's, uh, <clears throat> that's a big question. To, to, to sum it up, I think the, um, the field of economics is, is uh, it's working, but it's not working the way we want it to. It's not really... Uh, we've, see, we've created a system that sort of, I don't know, I don't want to, but most of the, sometimes it works really well, but also sometimes it creates results that we're morally not happy with. And uh, that's point number one. Point number two, the economy is built in a way to be internally unstable, unfortunately. I think um, uh, in past two, three generations, the, the motto of the economy was that we were selling stability in order to buy growth. And we managed. We created an economic system which is very which can grow very rapidly, but also it can go bankrupt and, and crash in a second. So what I believe is the only prudent way forward is to create a stable economy rather than unstable and quick economy. And um, we've all seen this in 2008 and 2009 how 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 deadly a self ignited problem can be. There was no attack of terrorists, there was no competition from China or from, from, from Russia. This was no, no outside factor, this was an inherent factor of the economy. So which links, brings me to the third point uh, of my critique is that um, um, we have a tendency to believe that the economy is normal or depressed. Normal or depressed. Um, uh, I think this is a misdiagnosis. I think the economy is manic depressive. We exaggerate our beliefs and we spend, spend, spend and invest, invest. This is the situation I think right now, right today, summer of 2017, the economy is exhibiting uh, manic shows. Now the government is trying to keep the economy in the mania state, in the manic state, by budget deficits or by cheap money with very little or, or zero interest rates. This is artificial condition and uh, it doesn't really make sense to measure GDP in, in, in that condition because the natural condition should be much higher price for money and much lower budget deficit. Okay, but you say, okay, you, you we have to do the inverse. We have to sell growth to buy stability. Yes. That's what you claim, but my question is, how to do this? I, have you a clue? Have you some ideas about? Yeah, yeah this is very easy. Really? The, the 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 key is to produce budget surpluses. Budget. Budget surplus. Surplus. Yeah. yeah. Which slows down the economy. If, yeah. if if the government takes more money than it in because the normal situation of the government is it taxes like this. Yeah. And it gives back to the economy like this. Yeah, yeah. So this is artificial mm. sort of schizophrenia because we believe in small governments when it comes to taxes but we believe in big governments when it comes to uh, ex expenditure. Mm -hmm. So a typical picture of a modern society is tax revenue is here and expenses are here. This is deficit. And you add up these deficits and you create the debt of the country. The debt of the country, uh, uh, the debt of countries today is much, much higher than it was in 2007 or 2008. So we are much more fr fragile today. And I'm really not impressed that we are growing 4% because it really doesn't matter much. What, what I think a good economist, uh, a good steward should care for it primarily for the system to be stable. Secondly, for the system to be fair and just so that we don't discriminate women, we don't discriminate races, um, we keep the law, we don't corrupt each other. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and basically try to keep the society together. There have even been suggestions that we should measure the wealth of the society according to the poorest person in the society. Mm -hmm. so, so this is something that has been suggested by philosophers and, 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 and moralists. So, so um, um, yeah, the, the, the economy must be uh, uh, somehow subjected to other priorities than growth only. I mean, I have nothing against growth, but to me, growth is a priority number six, seven. There are higher priorities above that, and, and we should realize that, that the goal of the economy is to feed people and to not have people think about money and work and how are they going to survive. This is the role of the economy. 
Um, above that, um, we, should, we should try to use the economy for, for, for common good. Yeah, but you, you just developed this idea about morality, about common good. Uh, but there is a problem. Humanity is very greedy for, not from now, but for a thousand years. Yes. And so we are, uh, ma many people, not, uh, even not everyone, but most of the people, uh, if they have uh, one euro, they want two euro. If they have one million euro, they want two million euro. Right. Because they don't right. need it, yeah. okay? So how to introduce uh, morality uh, in economy. You claim that it's a very important point in your book, uh, the economy of good and evil, but uh, how to introduce this uh, moral dimension yep. uh, in this dimension where there's so many people look at their own selfish interests. Yep. I, I think it's okay for a human being to, to look for himself uh, as long as he doesn't or she doesn't harm others. Um, I think that um, you can see this a little bit in politics, today a politician who only cares for his own electorate will go down as an irrelevant, if I may use the example of Francois Hollande. Francois Hollande is a typical mm -hmm. politician of today, completely, or was, uh, completely irrelevant because he got stuck with his sort of, yeah. I only, I'm responsible for France only. Um, and uh, Macron now suddenly, or, or Merkel realized that no, 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 to, in order to be a good French president, I need to be a good European president. Yeah. And uh, so this is a little bit, I call this uh, getting rid of autism. So politically, the artists only look on their own profit in terms of votes. But the similar, similar situation I think is happening in, in companies. Companies have been um, autistic. Mm -hmm. They've been sort of uh, Fachidioten, if, if that word makes sense, expert idiots, only looking for profit and not caring about the rest of the society. This is changing. Uh, politicians, if you want to be a successful politician, you have to be able to care for more than just your responsibility. And I think this is also true of, of businesses. So, so a short way of putting it is that businesses, I think, are becoming less autistic. This is also why I write books. If I believed in regulation, I would probably work at, at the Ministry of Finance or, or somewhere to regulate the economy. But I believe that uh, it, it's, 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 it's rather, for me, it's more important to have, um, to have influence rather than uh, power. Mm -hmm. So in my writing and in my work, I try to influence and I, uh, people. And I think it's, I'm, I'm not arguing altruistically. I think it would be a better society for, for, for all of us. So I think the role of the economy is to feed the hungry and to, um, uh, to relax the disturbed. Uh, uh, once this is done, an educated society will try to have other goods to fulfill. And there are many good things that we as Europeans can do, um, be it um, uh, ending planetary hunger, being um, uh, united in, in, in issues and trying to have values that uh, understand that the economy is a subject to a higher norm. Yeah. So to finish, the problem is that, you, of course, some companies are less autistic, as you said, okay? Yes. Less autistic. But you have huge pressure of company from pension fund, from all the, the, the stock market yeah. and so on. Yeah. And I think in the actual system, it's quite difficult to a company to resist uh, this. Uh, because there are a lot of people who make pressure on company to have more, 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 more uh, profit and return on investment. Yep. So how, uh, um, how are you optimistic about the, the future you, you try yep. to describe? Yeah. What gives you this optimism? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, uh, I, 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 I simply, um, uh, so, so you talk about pension funds and, and investment companies. This is interesting because um, somehow we have taken growth not as a result but as an assumption. So the French pension system is built under the assumption that the economy will grow 1-2% a year. Where we took this as economists, I don't know. It's not written in the sky, it's not written in the Bible. <laughs> Did any economists have a dream about it? Where it historically it doesn't make sense at all. The economy has always been going up and down. Uh, but the naive, the naivety of our, soci of our, of our, of our uh, society today is that we 
have built our social system, pension system, unemployment schemes, everything on the assumption that every day uh, it will grow. So this is a little bit like building a, 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 a yacht under the assumption that every day favorable winds will grow. Now I have nothing against growth, mm. but we shouldn't um, expect it every day. So I have, like I have nothing against good weather. Mm. I think good weather is a great thing. But uh, we also need rain. Uh, and to live a life that you think that every day should be a sunny day is a recipe for a depressing life. Mm -hmm. And this is what we have been, this is very, of course, if you build a ship under the assumption that every day there will be good winds, mm. it's not a good ship. Yeah. And this is how we have built our economy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's only, it, and, and so this is why there is so much surprise when the economy, when the economy doesn't grow. Maybe one more allegory, if I may because we are here in the beautiful Switzerland and I've seen many cows brazing over the fields. Um, so this is, a, this is a parable about capitalism. Uh, so a cowboy comes to a cow and he's milking the cow and suddenly the cow stops giving him milk and he gets up and he starts beating the cow, hitting her and screaming at her, you're a bad cow, why did you, I need your milk for my children, for my growth, for my whatever, da 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 da. You are a stupid cow <laughs> uh, for not giving me more milk. And because it's a story, my story, the cow can s speak. speak yeah. So the cow looks at the cowboy and says, but uh, why are you beating me? I have already given you all my milk. And you don't even know where it is. So let me tell you, I've given you 12 baskets of milk. One of them you've kicked over. The second one you've drunk alone when nobody else was watching. The third one has a dent. The fourth one is rotting. The, the Fifth one, you don't even know where it is. And you are blaming me for not giving you enough milk. So this is to me a sort of a, 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 a parable of capitalism. So maybe, maybe, maybe not today, but one day this will be the case that capitalism will give us really everything that it could. And we shouldn't really complain about capitalism, about the redistribution of wealth. Capitalism, even Marx admitted that capitalism is the most powerful mm -hmm. engine to make nations rich. Um, but uh, it is up to us how we spread the milk. So it is not the fault of the economy that we can't really use and store and share the milk properly. A last question about you, personal question. Those are always you the most difficult ones, yes. yes. You say, you speak about morality, you speak about good and evil, you speak about common good, and you say in the lecture you're a spiritual person, so what is your, I will not call this religious background, but what is your uh, spiritual m moving force in you? Uh, because I think to speak like you speak, speak about uh, morality, value, you must have, uh, you must be drive by something. So I must be, what, have you a sort of spiritual driving force? Well, I think every human being uh, is a spiritual being. I mean, there is no way denying it. The whole idea of consciousness is a spiritual, I mean, where, this is, and I always ask my friend when I say, when you say I, where do you point? Just imagine that you're saying a sentence, I go home, where do you point your finger? I go home. Yeah, I go home. Yeah, you do like this. I go home. So your I is somewhere here. Yeah. Right? You never say, I go home. No. <laughs> yeah. But yet, the con we sort of perceive consciousness like being behind our eyes. Mm -hmm. Just really try to imagine that you are here. Yeah. It's actually quite difficult. Yeah. Yeah? Because we have this stupid idea that we are behind the cameras, but <laughs> our spirit could easily be here or <laughs> consciousness. So, so to me, uh, uh, everything is spiritual. Everything that matters is money is spiritual. Money is, money is nothing else but spiritual. <laughs> I mean, uh, I take, uh, this is Czech money. Oh, this is, okay, this is British pound. So it's a piece of paper. If I say it's 20, it's 20. If I say it's 200, it's 200. Whatever the, as the same piece of paper, whatever we say it is, it is. It's spiritual. This paper has nothing to do with it. When I send you money from my bank account, I am sending you spiritual, non-existing entities. And I think to, to try to deny it is really not helpful in, in any way for anybody. But there's an agreement that it's 20 between you and me. Yes, <laughs> yes. If we agree it's 20, it's 20. If we agree it's 200, it's 200. Same piece of paper. It's just a matter of spiritual, spiritual agreement. And, and if, you look, if you think of software, everything here is spiritual. I mean, the alarm here is spiritual. It's not a real alarm if you open the iPhone up, if you could. Uh, you will find that there is really no alarm, but there is a spirit of the alarm. But it's not really the definition of spirituality that you use usually. You extend this notion. I yeah, think. I extend the notion of spirituality to everything that uh, needs spirit 
to understand. So a computer program is a, is a spirit. If, uh, to our ancestors, this would be a perfect example of a spirit. It doesn't have any form, it doesn't have any body, it pu uh, uh, does the function exactly as it's supposed to be. So a computer program or a computer algorithm is the most modern and most exact and maybe also most useful that I'm not so sure about, but in any case, it's a form of myth. A computer program is a myth. It doesn't really exist. It, it's not here, it's not there, it's sort of everywhere, but nowhere at the same time. So there are, mm, our relationship also here is spiritual. You can't even imagine, although we are being very friendly to each other, there are institutions guarding our debate. For example, the institution of language, or the institution of, of, of courtesy, or the institution of, I know that you will not hit me, because if you would, the police would come. And these are all in spiritual, un invisible, agreements between the two of us that we sort of tend to ignore but this is actually what makes the conversation possible okay thank you very much thank you for this conversation <laughs>